production, and um, many of the technical aspects of, of farming and marketing, um, and where community food systems fits in is in the center of this Venn diagram of improving farm production and profitability, promoting better nutrition and food access, and enhancing local communities. Within Michigan State University Extension, our work has focused in three areas, and those are food systems education. This is for the consumer, so that they can understand uh, what the products are, and how to use them, and how to uh, maximize their nutritional benefit. Uh, farming uh, enterprise development, so some of my colleagues are going to talk about the work that they do to help farmers get started and to improve their practices. And finally, what we call farm to institution, which is a whole host of activities trying to move local food into local uh, institutions, hospitals, local universities, uh, what we call a primary, secondary school, um, uh, because we have school cafeterias and those things. We want those children to be able to benefit from having access to local food. Culturally, something that I learned from Mrs. Rani was that uh, the Indian diet is 98% fresh. And that's not the case in the United States. Um, we, as a country, eat a lot of processed foods, a lot of foods that are created for convenience and speed, um, not necessarily for um, nutrition or health. And um, as a result, some people don't have a very a widely varied diet with lots of fruits and vegetables. So we emphasize uh, the bounty of our agriculture. We produce beautiful fruits and vegetables. Um, we have the second most diverse agricultural profile of any state in the United States. Um, and the first is California. And if you're familiar with California, they produce almonds and citrus fruits and avocados. But we don't have the climate <laughs> to produce those things. Um, part of what makes our diversity so great is that uh, we produce a number of horticultural products, plants for sale, um, Christmas trees are a large industry, and um, a lot of land is devoted to those things. So this just gives you an idea of where community food systems fits in. Um, we have a team that has many multidisciplinary activities going on. We try to have a few of those programs in common, but we do many things um, on our team. Um, we, we do school garden training for teachers. So we're not teaching the children, but we're instructing the teachers. Um, also encouraging them to blend garden lessoning, lessons in with science, math, and other curriculum. Sometimes even writing activities will revolve around the garden. Um, we talk a lot about on-farm food safety, and there's a lot of training that goes into that. Um, there are regulations that are not yet in place, but are coming, and so we're trying to prepare farmers for the enacting of that legislation. We have a large program that we call Farm to Glass, and this is creating agricultural products that can be brewed and distilled into beer and spirits. And um, it's pretty, it's relatively unique, but it involves regenerating a bar, um, create change in their communities around um, buying fresh food, uh, promoting local agriculture. And um, we have a number of conferences that help farmers, consumers, and um, other allies in the food movement uh, to learn from one another. We're working on um, developing food pantries, and I was so thankful to be sitting next to Dr. Chandra. He asked me about um, the food bank, which is charitable food that is um, shared with people of low income. Um, it's an access point for food, but generally it doesn't have a lot of choice associated with it. So people are not selecting foods, they are being given uh, staple foods that they can then eat. We want to make sure that those uh, staple foods include some fresh fruits and vegetables because that is so important. Um, we also work on farmer's markets, which I'm going to talk about. 
uh, farm and business development. And in communities like Detroit, Michigan, and Flint, um, there's a lot of vacant land because of disinvestment and deindustrialization. So the vacant land is being, in some cases, converted into agricultural production in the city. So we're seeing a blend of urban and farming in new ways. There are even orchards that are being built in urban communities to grow fruit. And there's a lot more. So I, I, it's hard for me to want to tell you everything and give you just enough. So uh, thank you very much for understanding. In the United States, our food system works very well at two scales. A global food system where products that are produced in our state, grains and cereals like uh, corn and soybeans, are moved around the world and traded on a global commodity scale. Um, when we go to our large scale supermarkets and grocery stores, um, we see products, we have lots of choice and they're coming from wherever the price and the production is available. So what's unusual for us uh, would be to have um, summer season foods in our cold winter available. Um, that is a change that's happened over time. But now, for example, we can get strawberries all year long. And we're in a climate where you can only grow strawberries in the summertime. Um, there is um, lots of choice at those large grocery stores. And there's downward price pressure. So there is increasing desire to have th that food be as inexpensive as possible. And then we have a local food system, which is direct to consumer in many cases. And um, the availability varies by season, by climate, and by region. So when we experience a crop loss, and Dr. Dwyer mentioned a, a fruit freeze that happened in 2014. In 2012, we had a late freeze that uh, caused apple blossoms to die off. And we had virtually no apple crop, no grapes, no peaches that year. Um, and so that's something that climate change is accelerating and adverse and unpredictable weather patterns are increasing. Um, prices can be higher at those um, local direct-to-consumer outlets, but the farmer keeps more of what he or she makes when they go to market. So what we're trying to do is build a regional food system that moves products within a shorter distance uh, to cut down on transportation costs. Um, Michigan is very proud to produce a lot of asparagus, and, um, but asparagus is, has a very short season. In May is the <coughs> asparagus season. And, um, but we can get asparagus year round. It comes from Peru and um, very low prices and very low wages are paid to the workers that are harvesting in Peru. We want to make people aware of some of the justice issues that exist around food um, on a global basis. So we're trying to rebuild a food system that works in smaller segments. Before we had international shipping and travel and uh, trucking industries, um, we had sh food travel shorter distances. It will increase trans uh, excuse me, increase transparency and traceability. And that's an important thing we've identified for food safety. If there is foodborne illness that comes from the farm, we want to be able to know exactly where it came from, not just that it came from that farm, but in some cases that it came from that field because we know when it was harvested. Um, we also want to keep transactions within our geographic region. Michigan wants to be able to capture the dollars that are spent within Michigan for food. And that's very important. Our lawmakers and taxing authorities very much want all of the money to be kept within our small region. When money is spent locally on food, it circulates in the economy more often. A local farmer, unlike a global company, 
will spend money buying implements and inputs in their own community rather than seeking the lowest price on a global scale. We also have a large food processing industry in Michigan, and we want to capture the economic value that is received from processing and packaging food within the state. And we also hear from shoppers, from consumers, that they desire local food. They want to be able to identify the food that they bought. They would like to be able to have a connection with the farmer, and in some cases, visit the farm. So the uh, USDA Economic Research Service, and I'm sorry I didn't put the um, citation here, reported that um, food sales have increased for farms that market directly. Um, and that's, that's a short-term finding. I don't know if that trend will persist over time, but that was what was found um, in the 2012 agricultural census. I want to highlight one of our partners. Um, I added this information because if you're, when you are able to visit the United States and visit Michigan, it would be very beneficial for you to meet with our partners at the Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems. They created the first policy document for our state that laid out goals for how we want to increase, um, improve the food system by the year 2020. Some of that included farm to institution purchases. Some of that included um, moving food more effectively and making sure that labor was being paid fairly. The vision statement is a thriving economy, equity and sustainability for Michigan, the country and the planet through food systems rooted in local regions and centered on food that is healthy, green, fair, and affordable. So food that nourishes people is what healthy is. Food that is produced in a way that is uh, environmentally sustainable is what is meant by green. Food that is fair is where a, 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 a sustainable wage is paid and prices meet um, the requirement. And food that is affordable is, you know, uh, many times organic production, for example, is priced out of the reach of low-income people. They also started, and this I think is might be interesting for those of you who are interested in supply chain management, they started uh, an innovation and learning network for um, people who are interested in creating food hubs. So I don't know, is anyone familiar with the concept of a food hub? Okay. <laughs> Garrett. Um, good job. Uh, a food hub is a centrally located facility with a business management structure facilitating the aggregation, storage, processing, distribution, and or marketing of locally and regional, local and regional food products. Um, they're all very different. They're, there's not one model that is designed to work perfectly. They are, it is a, um, it is an idea that can suit many different uh, corporate structures, cooperative structures, uh, communities, and products. Um, essentially what this is, is the hub would buy food or would market food from a farm based on its availability to those institutions or other buyers that need large quantities. And they could aggregate from many farms. So, for example, if someone wanted to produce um, a salsa, which is a condiment, it's it's a spicy condiment, it's Mexican, and um, they needed tomatoes. One farm, one small farm may not be able to meet their need, but many small farms might have enough. And they, instead of, instead of that company going to each small farm to contract, they go to one centrally located place where food is aggregated and then moved um, into that production. And the farmer also only has to deal with one person. They can drop off at one place instead of delivering to many places. Um, and that's really, that's very important when you think about um, 
there sometimes are very small windows for harvesting and um, to get things into storage. Um, and this allows for, for that to happen relatively quickly because the food hub is doing the marketing or may have the storage facility. So here's a little bit of background about farmers markets in the USA. According to the US Department of Agriculture, and this I think is a 2017 number, there are 8,687 farmers markets in the USA. In Michigan, there are approximately 300 farmers markets. And the reason it says approximately is that um, markets often are being started and at the same time may cease operation. So there is some, what we would call churn in that number where it goes up and down, but it's hovering around 300. Farmers markets are often organized in one community. Sometimes they are sponsored by the local government or an agency of the local government. Sometimes they are sponsored by a local non-governmental organization. And sometimes they are established as non-governmental organizations themselves. That's the model. Um, but there's a lot of diversity in markets. This is a map from the Michigan Farmers Market Association that shows um, where every market that they know of exists in the state. <coughs> and if you remember, Dr. Dwyer talked about the population is very small in this area. Even so, you can see there are many farmers markets. Um, this is where a lot of our fruit production exists. And this is where the bulk of our population lives. We have many, many farmers markets. Um, and the only designation that's different between this icon and this icon is that this farmer's market is a member of this association and this farmer's market is not, but all of them are listed in this directory. Um, farmer's markets are represented by a, an NGO or what we might call a farmer producer organization in Michigan and it's called the Michigan Farmer's Market Association. Their mission is to advance farmers markets to create a thriving marketplace for local food and farm products. And um, I'm not sure exactly how a farmers market is defined in India. I know you have many bazaars and there's many um, informal uh, um, marketing that happens in very heavily trafficked areas. We got a chance to visit near the Charminar and saw stalls all along uh, in the area, um, selling lots of fruit. Farmers markets are um, defined as a public and recurring assembly of farmers or their representatives selling direct to consumer food products uh, that they have produced themselves. Uh, they are organized for the purpose of facilitating personal connections that create mutual benefits for local farmers, vendors, shoppers, and communities. So that within that designation, there's lots of variability. Here is one example. So international news, as Dr. Dwyer said, is Flint, Michigan, where there was a crisis with lead in the water. And um, that is where I was born. That's my hometown. So I'm very familiar with it. And uh, for as long as I can remember, the market has operated on three days. So the market is open. Um, it's not open every day. It's open Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And that has existed since my grandmother was shopping there. Certain days were days when she went to market and bought food. Um, they have just rebuilt a new market in 2014, before, before we knew there was, before the water situation happened. Um, they have an outdoor market under this pavilion that operates May to October. That's our warmest part of the year. And they have an indoor market that operates all year long. And you can see here, there are not only stalls, but gathering spaces, places for people to stop. <clears throat> There's um, prepared food, so people can have a meal, lunch, or um, they can get coffee or tea and sit and have meetings. 
there's gathering space inside, and um, they pay a fee to be present. Each, sorry, each farmer would pay a fee to be present. Here is another example of a farmer's market. Three times annually, the Michigan Farmers Market Association holds an event, kind of like a festival, of a farmer's market on the grounds of the Capitol. That's the, that's the, the home of our state government. And they bring the farmer's market directly to the front lawn of that market. And as you can see here, it's very busy. And there's lots of beautiful food for sale. And all kinds of families and adults. Um, this is not only a farmer's market, but it's a way of demonstrating to all of the local government, all of the state government workers and leadership legislators how important farmers markets are and how important agriculture is we bring it right to their front yard <laughs> right right to their step and we say this is why farmers markets are so important this market attracts vendors from all over the state uh, bringing fresh fish from the streets of Mackinac bringing um, uh, as you can see flowers berries and um, it's a way of, uh, like I said, not only offering farm products to the people who are working in the capital, but also to promote farmers markets. Um, the market happens every, the last Thursday of every month. And the reason why, I think this is the cleverest thing. That's the day that everyone gets their paycheck. <laughs> so they get their paycheck and look, Here's where you can spend some money, right on our front lawn. So why do communities in the United States want farmers markets? We have large grocery stores, and we have what we call supermarkets. We even have stores that sell everything from tires to fruit to soap to clothing, all under one store. Um, but farmers markets are an important direct market for farmers to sell their products. They are a place of food access for a community. Um, people want to get food directly from the farm, directly from their farmer. They want to have a good feeling about food safety. I can look you in the eye and trust you. Um, and when, if I have a question about the food, how it was raised, if there were chemicals involved, I can ask you directly. Um, and I can also ask you maybe some ways that you would recommend preparing it. And there are something called a food, sorry, whoops, that was fast, uh, a food desert. And the USDA has a designation of a food desert. It's a place where people would have to travel uh, greater than five miles to find a place where they could buy food um, or where they would be challenged to find adequate transportation to get where they're going. Maybe because of they don't own a vehicle, they don't have a car, um, taxis are less common, and um, in rural areas, there are no taxis. Um, also, it's a gathering place for the community, an important place where people can meet and see their neighbors and circulate. Uh, just in the same way that you might bump into someone if you were at a bazaar, that's what farmers markets can create that atmosphere. And that's sometimes why our local governments want to have them, because they're a point of interest, they're a place where people, where visitors come. So why do farmers markets, uh, why do farmers want to sell directly? Um, farmers can choose where they, or how, they, how these farmers markets operate. Farmers can choose where they want to sell, um, but they may have to apply to uh, have space at the farmer's market. Uh, fruits and vegetables are often in demand, um, but there's also meat, dairy, bread, plants, and cut flowers for sale. They're charged a fee, and the fee can be daily or it can be for a season. So you could pay one price to be there from May through October. Um, and Farmers markets advertise and promote the market as a destination 
but also may invest in adverti uh, advertisement and promotion of individual vendors. Um, and they host companion events to attract people. So there will be uh, musicians or activities for kids at the market. Um, they also have the ability to accept food assistance dollars. Uh, people who are low income can use a can get food assistance dollars by verifying their income is within the range that's approved. They get a, a, an electronic card, like an ATM or a credit card, but it can only be used to buy food. And um, this money comes from the federal government to states, and then states create the program and regulate that for food assistance. Um, each, each outlet that takes food assistance has to have a, a, an application with the U, USDA. They have to be approved as a vendor. And they also have to have a, a machine that can read the card. Um, and interestingly enough, those cards cannot be read by a typical credit card reader. So you know how some people will have a card reader that can fit into a phone? You can't do that. <laughs> you have to, yeah, we've made it challenging. So um, people can use their food assistance dollars at markets. All right, so here are a few challenges. Um, our customers, our consumers, may or may not understand seasonality. They have become accustomed to going to that large grocery store and being able to buy what they want any time of year. So they have to adjust to seasonality. For example, uh, it's nice to see watermelons for sale uh, here in February. Um, in Michigan, we won't have watermelons until the end of August at the earliest, uh, just because of cold weather and freezing. So they have to adjust to the fact that the supply is not guaranteed and that there are weather and climate changes. For example, apples may not be available or it may have been a bad year for peaches. Um, and it's not as convenient compared to grocery stores or supermarkets. There's also a trend now where people are getting meal kits delivered to their home. So they get to cook, but everything's been measured out for them. They get just a kit in the mail that they make their meal from. So there are transportation challenges for people to get to the market during the hours that it's open, um, which are limited. Most of these large uh, grocery stores in major urban areas are open 24 hours a day. Um, and they're open 365 days a year. Um, so we've gotten very used to that and separated from agriculture as a result. Um, so some of the challenges for the farmer are they, they may be directly competing with the farmers who are selling the same product. So I saw a lot of grapes for sale. <laughs> um, that's challenging because it creates downward price pressure. Um, and then they, the time that they're selling at the market is time that they're not on their farm growing because they are the ones who are putting it all together and bringing it to the market center. Um, the opportunity is that there are, if I go back to that slide with the map and all the markets, there are so many farmers markets that the farmer is in demand, so they get to choose. And um, they can have the best option that works for them. They can create a niche for themselves or a niche for themselves uh, for their products, and they can get direct feedback from customers. Did you like that eggplant? Oh, you didn't? Maybe I should grow a different variety next year. And um, they can sell directly with no middleman. So uh, farmer's market organizers try to gather data, but um, they're not required to report income to the government. Farmers themselves generally would not share their income data if given a choice. In some cases, markets have made that mandatory at the market level. In other cases, um, they ask uh, for voluntary sharing of information. And they can get help from this NGO, the Michigan Farmers Market Association, to gather data. Customers are often counted and sometimes surveyed about why they're coming to the market, what did they choose, uh, who did they come with, how much did they think they were gonna spend, and then 
those food assistance dollars are tracked by the federal government and by the market, so that is information that the market is able to use. So the ways that we support farmers market educational training include a certificate training program that provides leadership and professional development for the person that manages the market. So every market has a person that manages. They deal with the farmer. They try to attract the customers. Um, they're sort of the host of the market itself. The, um, they create the rules, so heavily rule-based, but the rules are negotiated with input from the farmers and to find out what works for everyone. Um, they may promote also through social media, through websites, through word of mouth. Um, people saying, I, I, got great, I got a great watermelon at the market today. It tasted so delicious. You should go get one. Um, they settle disputes between vendors, which is common. Um, you're face to face with someone who's selling something similar to you. They may say something <laughs> derogatory about your product. Um, or they may just they, they may not think they're operating fairly. They they do that processing of the food assistance funds and everything else to operate the market. Putting up a tent, putting out a sign to let people know it's open. So here's another project that we're involved with called Michigan Fresh. These are fact sheets that Michigan State University has developed, uh, educating consumers. Um, at farmers markets and, and, and through the internet as well about the selection, preparation, preservation, and cultivation of Michigan grown food. This is what the fact sheet looks like. I apologize, I didn't think to bring one. Um, Courtney said Michigan Fresh, she, she threw me into this. I didn't, I included it because she mentioned it. Um, there is a program called Discover Michigan Fresh for adults and for children. So what we find is sometimes people don't know how to talk directly to the farmer or ask questions. They're reluctant. In our culture, asking a question can sometimes seem challenging, whereas in some cases it's just because you want to know or because you want to open a dialogue. Um, but we sometimes uh, find it impolite. Uh, I don't think it's impolite, but we're trying to train people to get used to asking questions. So there are, there's a, there's a version for kids, for children, with activities including arts and crafts and, um, and trivia and knowledge about the farmer's market. People learn how to shop seasonally and engage with products for sale. They also learn about quantities. Um, in some cases, people may not cook they may be learning to cook or reintroducing cooking into their family because we have so many prepared food options. Um, and so they, they need to learn how much goes into a recipe or what a bushel is separate from a quart or something like that. So I think I, I landed this just about half an hour, maybe a little over, but I wanted to leave time for questions and these are the website addresses for the Center for Regional Food Systems that I mentioned at Michigan State and the Michigan Farmers Market Association. So, happy to take questions. exists in the And if you remember, Dr. Dwyer talked about the population is very small in this area. Even so, you can see there are many farmers markets. Um, this is where a lot of our fruit production exists. And this is where the bulk of our population lives. We have many, many farmers markets. Um, and the only designation that's different between this icon and this icon is that this farmers market is a member of this association, and this farmers market is not. But all of them are listed in this directory. <laughs> um, farmers markets are represented by a, an NGO or what we might call a farmer producer organization in Michigan and it's called the Michigan Farmers Market Association. Their mission is to advance farmers markets to create a thriving marketplace for local food and farm products. And 
Um, I'm not sure exactly how a farmer's market is defined in India. I know you have many bazaars and there's many um, informal uh, um, marketing that happens in very heavily trafficked areas. We got a chance to visit near the Charminar and saw stalls all along uh, in the area um, selling lots of fruit. Farmers markets are um, defined as a public and recurring assembly of farmers or their representatives selling direct to consumer food products uh, that they have produced themselves. Uh, they are organized for the purpose of facilitating personal connections that create mutual benefits for local farmers, vendors, shoppers, and communities. So that within that designation, there's lots of variability. Here is one example. So international news, as Dr. Dwyer said, is Flint, Michigan, where there was a crisis with lead in the water. And um, that is where I was born. That's my hometown. So I'm very familiar with it. And uh, for as long as I can remember, the market has operated on three days. So the market is open. Um, it's not open every day. It's open Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And that has existed since my grandmother was shopping there. Certain days were days when she went to market and bought food. Um, they have just rebuilt a new market in 2014. Before before we knew there was before the water situation happened. Um, they have an outdoor market under this pavilion that operates May to October. That's our warmest part of the year. And they have an indoor market that operates all year long. And you can see here, there are not only stalls, but gathering spaces, places for people to stop. There's um, prepared food, so people can have a meal, lunch, or um, they can get coffee or tea and sit and have meetings. There's gathering space inside and um, they pay a fee to be present. Each, sorry, each farmer would pay a fee to be present. Here is another example of a farmer's market. Three times annually, the Michigan Farmers Market Association holds an event, kind of like a festival of a farmer's market on the grounds of the Capitol. That's the, that's the, the home of our state government and they bring the farmer's market directly to the front lawn of that market. And as you can see here, it's very busy, and there's lots of beautiful food for sale, and all kinds of families and adults. Um, this is not only a farmer's market, but it's a way of demonstrating to all of the local government, all of the state government workers and leadership legislators how important farmers markets are and how important agriculture is we bring it right to their front yard <laughs> right right to their step and we say this is why farmers markets are so important this market attracts vendors from all over the state uh, bringing fresh fish from the Straits of Mackinac bringing um, uh, as you can see flowers berries and um, it's a way of, uh, like I said, not only offering farm products to the people who are working in the capital, but also to promote farmers markets. Um, the market happens every, the last Thursday of every month. And the reason why, I think this is the cleverest thing. That's the day that everyone gets their paycheck. <laughs> so they get their paycheck and look, Here's where you can spend some money, right on our front lawn. So why do communities in the United States want farmer's markets? We have large grocery stores, and we have what we call supermarkets. We even have stores that sell everything from tires to fruit to soap to clothing, all under one store. Um, but farmers markets are an important direct market for farmers to sell their products. They are a place of food access for a community. Um, people want to get food directly from the farm, 
directly from their farmer. They want to have a good feeling about food safety. I can look you in the eye and trust you. Um, and when, if I have a question about the food, how it was raised, if there were chemicals involved, I can ask you directly. Um, and I can also ask you maybe some ways that you would recommend preparing it. And there are something called a food, sorry, whoops, that was fast, uh, a food desert. And the USDA has a designation of a food desert in a place where people would have to travel uh, greater than five miles to find a place where they could buy food um, or where they would be challenged to find adequate transportation to get where they're going. Maybe because of they don't own a vehicle, they don't have a car, um, taxis are less common, and um, in rural areas, there are no taxis. Um, also, it's a gathering place for the community, an important place where people can meet and see their neighbors and circulate. Um, just in the same way that you might bump into someone if you were at a bazaar, that's what farmers markets can create that atmosphere. And that's sometimes why our local governments want to have them, because they're a point of interest, they're a place where people, where visitors come. So why do farmers markets, uh, why do farmers want to sell directly? Um, farmers can choose where they, or how, they, how these farmers markets operate. Farmers can choose where they want to sell, um, but they may have to apply to uh, have space at the farmer's market. Uh, fruits and vegetables are often in demand, um, but there's also meat, dairy, bread, plants, and cut flowers for sale. They're charged a fee, and the fee can be daily or it can be for a season. So you could pay one price to be there from May through October. Um, and Farmers markets advertise and promote the market as a destination, but also may invest in adverti uh, advertisement and promotion of individual vendors. Um, and they host companion events to attract people. So there will be uh, musicians or activities for kids at the market. Um, they also have the ability to accept food assistance dollars. Uh, people who are low income can use a can get food assistance dollars by verifying their income is within the range that's approved. They get a, a, an electronic card, like an ATM or a credit card, but it can only be used to buy food. And um, this money comes from the federal government to states, and then states create a program and regulate that for food assistance. Um, each each outlet that takes food assistance has to have uh, a, an application with the U USDA. They have to be approved as a vendor. And they also have to have uh, a machine that can read the card. Um, and interestingly enough, those cards cannot be read by a typical <coughs> credit card reader. So you know how some people will have a card reader that can fit into a phone? You can't do that. <laughs> you have to. We've made it challenging, so um, people can use their food assistance dollars at markets. All right, so here are a few challenges. Um, our customers, our consumers, may or may not understand seasonality. They have become accustomed to going to that large grocery store and being able to buy what they want any time of year. So they have to adjust to seasonality. For example, uh, it's nice to see watermelons for sale uh, here in February. Um, in Michigan, we won't have watermelons until the end of August at the earliest, uh, just because of cold weather and freezing. So they have to adjust to the fact that the supply is not guaranteed and that there are weather and climate changes. For example, apples may not be available or it may have been a bad year for peaches. Um, and it's not as convenient compared to grocery stores or supermarkets. There's also a trend now where people are getting meal kits delivered to their home. So they get to cook, but everything's been measured out for them. They get just a kit in the mail that they make their meal from. So there are transportation challenges for people to get to the market during the hours that it's open, um, which are limited. 
most of these large uh, grocery stores in major urban areas are open 24 hours a day. Um, and they're open 365 days a year. Um, so we've gotten very used to that and separated from agriculture as a result. Um, so some of the challenges for the farmer are, they, they may be directly competing with the farmers who are selling the same product. So I saw a lot of grapes for sale. <laughs> um, that's challenging because it creates downward price pressure. Um, and then the time that they're selling at the market is time that they're not on their farm growing because they are the ones who are putting it all together and bringing it to the market center. Um, the opportunity is that there are, well, if I go back to that slide with the map and all the markets, there are so many farmers markets that the farmer is in demand, so they get to choose. And um, they can have the best <laughs> option that works for them. They can create a niche for themselves or a niche for themselves uh, for their products, and they can get direct feedback from customers. Did you like that eggplant? Oh, you didn't? Maybe I should grow a different variety next year. And um, they can sell directly with no middleman. So uh, farmers market organizers try to gather data, but um, they're not required to come to the government. Farmers themselves generally would not share their income data if given a choice. In some cases, markets have made that mandatory at the market level. In other cases, um, they ask uh, for voluntary sharing of information. And they can get help from this NGO, the Michigan Farmers Market Association, to gather data. Customers are often counted and sometimes surveyed about why they're coming to the market, what did they choose, uh, who did they come with, how much did they think they were gonna spend, and then those food assistance dollars are tracked by the federal government and by the market, so that is information that the market is able to use. So the ways that we support farmers market educational training include a certificate training program that provides leadership and professional development for the person that manages the market. So every market has a person that manages. They deal with the farmer, they try to attract the customers. Um, they're sort of the host of the market itself. The, um, they create the rules, so heavily rule-based, but the rules are negotiated with input from the farmers and to find out what works for everyone. Um, they may promote also through social media, through websites, through word of mouth. Um, People saying, I, I got great, I got a great watermelon at the market today. It tasted so delicious. You should go get one. Um, they settle disputes between vendors, which is common. Um, you're face to face with someone who's selling something similar to you. They may say something <laughs> derogatory about your product. Um, or they may just they, they may not think they're operating fairly. They, they do that processing of the food assistance funds and everything else to operate the market. Putting up a tent, putting out a sign to let people know it's open. So here's another project that we're involved with called Michigan Fresh. These are fact sheets that Michigan State University has developed uh, educating consumers um, at farmers markets and, and, and through the internet as well about the selection, preparation, preservation, and cultivation of Michigan-grown food. This is what the fact sheet looks like. I apologize, I didn't think to bring one. Um, Courtney said Michigan Fresh, she, she threw me into this. I didn't, I included it because she mentioned it. Um, there is a program called Discover Michigan Fresh for adults and for children. So what we find is sometimes people don't know how to talk directly to the farmer or ask questions. They're reluctant. In our culture, asking a question can sometimes seem challenging, whereas in some cases it's just because you want to know or because you want to open a dialogue. Um, but we sometimes uh, find it impolite 
Uh, I don't think it's impolite, but we're trying to train people to get used to asking questions. So there are, there's a, there's a version for kid, for children, with activities including arts and crafts and, um, and trivia and knowledge about the farmer's market. People learn how to shop seasonally and engage with products for sale. They also learn about quantities. Um, in some cases, people may not cook. They may be learning to cook or reintroducing cooking into their family because we have so many prepared food options. Um, and so they, they need to learn how much goes into a recipe or what a bushel is separate from a quart or something like that. So I think I, I landed this just about half an hour, maybe a little over, but I wanted to leave time for questions. And these are the website addresses for the Center for Regional Food Systems that I mentioned at Michigan State and the Michigan Farmers Market Association. Happy to take questions.